last time I talked about the so-called Mario cadence, which is this thing that I have written right here. It's basically just three major chords in a row, like A flat major, B flat major, C major. And it sounds like this. Like so. And we talked about how there's something sort of special about this and how this particular kind of chord progression allows you to do multiple different voice leadings that are all equally small. So instead of going up like this, oops, it can also go down like that. But we also talked about the very first chord in the Mario theme. This thing right here, which has a D, an F sharp, and an E. And we talked about how the, the three notes of that are three notes that are separated by a whole step. So it's like taking the chord progression and turning it into a chord at the opening of the Mario theme. And last time I was a little bit ambivalent about whether that means anything, but I want to do something kind of playful and kind of fun today um, to show you what you might be able to make out of that. In particular, I want to emphasize here that music theory is really about noticing interesting details in music and seeing what you can do with them. It's about being playful and inventive and not about saying what you can or can't do with music. So since I've noticed this connection, the idea that there's this parallel between these three roots of the chords that are whole tone related and then these three notes in a single chord that are whole tone related, what can I do with that? So here's my idea. Um, you might not like how it ends up sounding. It's a little bit crunchy, but it's kind of fun. Now, if you live on the music theory internet, you've probably heard of the phrase negative harmony uh, popularized by Jacob Collier, where in some sense you take a chord progression and you flip it upside down. I want to suggest something that's a little bit like that, you might call it imaginary harmony in the sense of imaginary numbers in math. If you know anything about imaginary numbers as being kind of like a, a 90 degree rotation of, of something rather than a 180 degree rotation that negative harmony gives you. What I mean by that is let's imagine taking, let's imagine taking this first chord, this A flat, this A flat major chord right here and rotating it so that it lies on its side. Specifically, I'm gonna take the upper three notes. And my idea is I'm going to rotate this around so that the A flat right here, this thing that I'll highlight in blue, so that that becomes my first note in the bass right there then so that actually no so that this c right here becomes my next note in the bass and then finally so that this e flat right here becomes this note in the bass so in other words I've essentially taken what was a chord and I've turned it into a melody by flipping it on its side. You sort of get what I'm up to there? I've basically taken this chord progression and rotated it counterclockwise 90 degrees. I can do the same thing with the next two chords so that this B flat and this C, instead of being a melody, I'm gonna stack them as part of a single chord. So I might put the B flat up here, and I might put the C in the middle. And now this melody, rotated 90 degrees, is now the left-hand chord in this sort of sideways or imaginary version of the Mario cadence. And the reason I rotate it like this 
is this voicing, A flat, C, B flat, is equivalent to this voicing, D, F sharp, E. It's the same kind of chord. If I do the, the, if I do the same thing to the other voices, C, D, E is going to become my second chord right here. C and then D and then E. And finally, E flat, F, G is going to become my final chord. E flat, F, G. So this is the sideways or imaginary version of the Mario cadence. And you'll notice that one thing this allows me to do is now, instead of having major triads progressing by whole step, I have whole steps progressing by major triad. They're all, in every individual voice, is sort of arpeggiating up a major triad. And what's neat about that is that sort of arpeggio up is exactly what the opening melody did at the beginning of the Mario theme. You see that the Mario theme goes E, C, E, G. It's arpeggiating C major. I could take that idea, and now I can do that with my sideways version of the Mario cadence and get a more dissonant kind of sound for that. So again, here was the opening of, of the Super Mario music. And now I'll, I'll play that sort of down a step, voiced with these Mario chords. So they're all going to sound like this. There we go. Sounds a little bit gross. But it is actually kind of really interestingly connected to how, how the Mario theme actually starts. I'm not sure I know of any actual music that does this sort of thing. It takes a chord progression and rotates it sideways, but it's a thing that you could play with, and it, it sort of is an interesting duality of this kind of chord progression right here. So anyway, take that for what it's worth. All right, let's move on to our main topic for today, which is talking about progressions between major and minor triads that are that live within a completely chromatic universe. That is, so far, we've talked about chord progressions that exist within a single major or minor key, any diatonic key. And we saw that as long as you're working within a key, you can always find the smallest voice leading between two chords using an algorithm that I've called upshifting or downshifting. So for instance, if I want to, if I want to compose a progression between a C major chord and an A minor chord. Since C major and A minor coexist within a single key, we should be able to find some connection between these two chords that either upshifts or downshifts. All the voices move up to the nearest note in the target chord, or they move down to the nearest note in the target chord. As a review of the last lecture, you should be able to figure out whether I want to use an upshift or a downshift here. I do, however, need to make sure that I actually have a complete chord, so that should be an E. And so we saw that if I, if I have a chord progression like this, I can do this with an upshift. And in this case, a very small upshift. C would stay the same, E would stay the same, and G would have to move up just one step to get to A. So all the voices, except for the bass voice, which as always just plays the roots of the chords, all of the upper notes in the chord either move up or they move down. And in this case, they move up. You've heard C major going to A minor many times, but it sounds like this. So for one of the homework questions that I gave over the last week, I asked you to look for an example of a chord progression between major and major or major and minor, basically a chord progression that starts on C major and goes somewhere else, where the smallest voice leading between those two chords isn't an upshift or a downshift. 
In other words, some of the voices have to move up and some of the voices have to move down. Did anyone have any luck finding such a chord progression? E major, perfect. Okay, so let's see how that works out. You're absolutely right. So if I start from a C major chord, and I'll voice it just the same as I always like to do. If I start from C, the contention is that if I go from a C major chord to an E major chord, and as always, my lowest note will just play the roots of the chords. If I do this, the smallest distance between these two chords involves some amount of contrary motion, that is, some motion up and some motion down. And I think, given these two roots, you can see intuitively how that might work. Of course, the note E can just stay the same between the two chords. So I think it seems natural to want to do that. But now, in this e, e major chord, I need E, G sharp, and B. Pretty clearly, the easiest way, or the smallest way to do that, is to take C down a step to B, and then G up a half step to G sharp. So here I have motion that's going up in one in one voice and down in another voice, giving me a total motion of two overall. And obviously, or maybe not obviously, these two chords can't coexist within any single major key. It would break our rule from last time if they did, but you can also see, for example, that this chord has a G sharp and this chord has a G natural, and there's no major key that has both G sharp and G natural in the same key. Chord progressions that do this tend to sound pretty cool. Here's C major, and here's E major. So just those two chords pack a good deal of punch. They sound pretty neat when you put them side by side like this. So that turns out to be one of only three different chord progressions that require you to do neither an upshift nor a downshift. That is, if I'm starting on if I'm starting on a C major chord, there are only three possible major or minor triads that will do this. C to E is one of them. Knowing that C to E is one, can someone else in the chat figure out what another possibility would be? Where's another chord that I could go to starting from C? Knowing that E major is one option actually might help you figure out another one. Think about it like this. These two chords, their roots were related by a major third. C the root of the first chord to E, the root of the second chord. That's up a major third. But if I do this progression in reverse, E major to C major, it would still have this weird effect of being neither upshifting or downshifting. So E to C could go down a major third. What does that suggest we could do if we wanted to start from C? Well, I could go down a major third from C. Down a major third from C would be a flat. And indeed, again, it turns out that this is one of the other possibilities. In this case, C would probably want to stay the same. E is going to want to move down a half step to E flat, and G is going to want to move up a half step to A flat, like so. And again, you can see that we have one half step down, one half step up for a total motion of two between these two chords. Now the third possibility is a little bit farther out there because the third possibility is going to connect C major to some sort of minor triad.
In fact, it turns out that if I copy this A flat major chord over, and then I say, well, what if I turn, so that's supposed to be C, what if I turn A flat major into A flat minor? Well, G is still going to go to A flat, E is still going to go to E flat, but C is now going to go down to C flat. So that adds a little bit more descending motion, but there still is this G to A flat that goes up. So here I have a connection between two chords of different qualities with contrary motion, a little bit more contrary motion. And it turns out that these are the only three two chord successions that require this, some sort of mixture of going up and going down. Just to emphasize the point that these all sound pretty cool, here's C going to E like we had before. Here's C going to A flat. And here's C going to A flat minor. All three of these force you to break out of a single key. And, of course, this same sort of thing is going to apply in any transposition. So if I start on a different chord from... If I start on a different chord than C major, then I'll end up with different chords. So, for instance, if I wanted to start with a D major chord, I'll just take C, shift it up. So there's D major. Let's suppose I wanted to do the equivalent of this last progression right here. We had C major to A flat minor. What's going to be the equivalent thing if I start on D? D major goes to what? Well, you could think about it as here C to A flat minor had a root motion down a major third and we changed quality. It'll be the same thing here. D major should go down a major third. That would be D major to B flat minor. All right, so we'll have A go up to B flat, F go down to F natural, and D will have to go down to D flat to give me the minor third. But in some sense, D major to B flat minor is the same sort of progression as C major to A flat minor. This is the sort of thing that within a key we have Roman numerals to share the similarity. But here, since it's not within a key, it's a little bit harder to have Roman numerals that make it clear that these are the same progression. So these sorts of chord progressions, I think, tend to have a really distinctive kind of sound. Because they don't stay within a single key, they tend to sound kind of spooky or uncanny, otherworldly, unreal, magical, majestic. In other words, they're basically perfect for science fiction or fantasy movie soundtracks. So we're going to talk about a lot of Hollywood film scores today, like Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings. We'll see that they all like to use chord progressions kind of like this. For our first example, I want to talk about the Imperial March, Darth Vader's music from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. So you probably know you probably know what this sounds like. I can't play the, the real recording for you, so I'm just going to play it on piano. It sounds like this. And I just want to talk about that much music. So what do we have going on here? It basically oscillates between two chords. This chord and this chord. Then we're back to the first one, second one, back to the first one. What are the chords that we're dealing with here? The first chord is G, B flat, and D. That's G minor. The second chord right here, E flat, G flat, and B flat. So that's going to be E flat minor.
the roots of these two chords are G and E flat. Or I could highlight them up here. G is the root of the first chord, E flat is the root of the second chord. And you can see the, di the distance between those two chords, G down to E flat, is a major third. So we have another chord progression here where the roots are related by a major third and they have the same quality. That's pretty similar to what we saw up here with C major going to A flat major or C major going to E major. Same quality, roots are related by a major third. Here, John Williams is doing that with minor chords, G minor to E flat minor. And you can see that when he does that, he gives us one motion that goes up. D right here goes up to E flat. And then there's one motion that goes down. G right here goes down to G flat. And then there's one note, B-flat, that's held between the two chords. So again, we have this sort of weird, spooky chord progression where the connection between them doesn't feel like it goes directionally up or down. It just sort of like orbits almost gravityless around the chromatic scale. So a two-chord progression is the simplest kind of progression that a composer can write, but if you pick the right two chords, you get a really nice effect. <laughs> Or if I play this a little bit higher so you can hear the notes more clearly. Like that. One thing I really like about what John, John Williams wrote here is if I, if I play just the melody, you'll notice that the melody is actually a major triad arpeggio. G, E flat, B flat. And since I know it, how it's harmonized, it sounds ominous and dark to me. But actually, if I were just to harmonize that with those three notes, it would sound like E flat major. It would actually sort of sound sort of heroic, maybe a little bit brighter. But when I harmonize it, it sounds like the dark side. And of course, E flat major the triad in the melody is sort of like the, the chord that strikes a balance between G minor and E flat major. Since it has E flat, the same, the same root as E flat minor, but it has G natural, the, the major third of E flat major, but also the root of G minor. So the melody is actually sort of balanced between these two chords. For just a little two bar lick, I think this is, this is really good composition. So anyways, that's our first example of some film scores that use this kind of progression. Now, when we were looking for chord progressions like this, to find these three, if you don't have a general rule for how chord connections work, if you don't know how to predict voice leading, to find these, you basically would have just had to go through every possibility and check to see if it'll give you this sort of relationship. And if you're just going to check by brute force, there's kind of a lot of possibilities to check. There are 24 different chord progressions, starting from C major. Right, you can start on C major, and then there are 12 different major chords to go to, including just repeating C major. And there are 12 different minor chords to go to, so there are 24 different possibilities altogether that you would have to check. And actually, somebody went through and did all of this and made a great post to Reddit. Um, it's uh, Yamham, or I don't know if it's Yamham in the chat. Um, if you go back to Reddit and, and see my posts announcing these, I, made a, I posted a link to this. Um, so we've already got a really great visualization of all 24 possibilities. But again, that is sort of exhaustive. That's a lot of brute force work that you have to do. The goal of my lecture today is to give you a simple way of remembering what the possibilities are for all 24 possibilities, major to major, major to minor, or in principle minor to minor, but that turns out to be the same as major to major. Basically what I'm going to do today is just give you something like a mnemonic to hold in your head all of the possibilities that this chart visualizes for you. So to do this, to think our way through the possibilities, I want to start with a visualization like this. What you're seeing right here is 
basically just like a what music theorists call a clock face, but it's basically just the chromatic scale, C, C sharp, D. You go all the way around the chromatic scale, B takes you back to C. So this is sort of like a visualization of musical space. But I want to think about this not as if these were individual notes in the chromatic scale, but as a layout of the 12 possible, possible major chords. So this guy right here is going to represent the C major chord for us. And so you can visualize progressions between two different major chords on this clock face or on this circle diagram. Now, if I start from C major, it turns out that there are only three major chords that require neither an upshift nor a downshift. First of all, there's C major itself. If I just stay on a chord, I'm obviously not moving up or down. So C major sort of is neither up nor down. But as we discussed, C major to E major is also one of these things where you have neither always going up nor always going down. C major to A flat major is the other one. So these are the three major chords, starting from C, that don't go up or down. Notice that basically what I've drawn here is an equilateral triangle. These three chords symmetrically divide up the 12 possible major chords that you could progress to. That's not a coincidence at all. That's actually very much at the core of what we're going to talk about. Now, again, starting from C major, it turns out that there are three different major chords that require you to upshift, that require you to move voices only upwards to get to the closest version of the chord. One of those is C sharp major. If you think about it, that, that should sort of make sense, right? If I just take C major and I add one sharp to all the notes in a, C, in a C major chord, I lift everything up by a half step, that gets me to C sharp major. And I think if you play around with that pretty intuitively, obviously, that's going to be the closest way. So you just lift everything in C major up one half step. So in blue, we have neither up nor down. In green, I'm going to highlight the chords that ask for an upshift from C major. C sharp is one of them. What are the other chords? There should be two other chords where the closest path to them from C major goes up. Can you find either of them? Well, one of them we already know from my last lectures, because we know that F major should be an upshift from C major. F major exists in the same key as C major, and therefore we can use my rule from last time, where C to F is root motion down by a fifth, and if the root motion is down by a fifth, then there should be an upshift. That's the best connection between them. So C sharp major is one possibility. F major is another possibility that requires upshifting. And it turns out that A major is the last one. C major to A major is an upshift connection between the two chords. And it turns out that there's no key that has both C major and A major in it. So this, is, this one is worth exploring a little bit. I'm going to flip back to my music notation and write out the best way to get between C major and A major. So we're going to go from C to A, both as major triads. I'll write out the roots of the chords right here. And then C, E, and G. Now my claim is that the, the shortest path between these two chords 
means taking all of the notes of C and moving them up to the nearest thing in A. So for example, C natural right here, the closest thing above it in an A major chord is C sharp, like this. E, well, E is actually shared between the two chords, so I could leave that alone. And then G, the closest thing in A major above G is A. So overall, G moves up by two half steps. E stays the same, so that's zero. And C moves to C sharp, that's up one half step. So the overall amount of motion between these two chords is three, which is actually, if in the grand scheme of things, not a lot of motion at all. C major to A major. And again, that's a pretty cool sound, I think, because it breaks outside of a single major key. But this one feels a lot more directed to me than the things I played for you earlier, because the upper, the upper voices all move up. So it feels like it's pushing forwards. There's a little bit more momentum behind this chord progression than the anti-gravity sort of chord progressions we heard for Darth Vader. So coming back here, we have three chords that are neither up nor down from C. We have three chords that are all upshifting from C. I think you won't be surprised to learn that there are also three chords that are a downshift from C. So actually no, let me do orange. So there are going to be three chords that move down from a C major chord. One of them, unsurprisingly, will be B major. Just like C to C sharp, you shift everything up. C to B, you shift everything down. Now, from here, I think you can probably guess what the pattern is going to be. Can you tell me what the other two chords should be that will go down from C major? One of them is G. Again, C to G, that stays within a single key. So we could have predicted that C to G is a downshift. Perfect. And then E flat is the other one. Yep, exactly. So it turns out that these three chords, again, they form an equilateral triangle. Those are the ones that force you to go down from C. Or they don't force you to, but if you want to take the shortest path, move the notes as little as possible, those are the ones that, to do that, you have to go down. And then finally, the last possibility we need to talk about is there are three chords, the three remaining chords, that allow you to go either up or down. Your pick. We talked about chords like this last time when we talked about the Mario cadence. We know that if you take a major triad and you just bump it up by a whole step, like C major to D major, that can be an upshift or a downshift, and either direction takes the same amount of motion. So I can go up a whole step to D. I could also go down a whole step to B flat. Now you can, I think, just visually predict what this pattern is going to be. The last chord that behaves this way is C major to F sharp major, a tritone away. So they're, they're almost like polar opposite chords. To go from C major to F sharp major, it's either all going up or all going down. And the claim is either direction should take the same amount of motion. In fact, it should take six half steps worth of change. Let's go back to the music notation and see what that looks like. So I'll just take my C major chord, I'll copy it over, and I'll copy it over twice. The first time I'm going to go from C major to F sharp major and go up, and the second time I'll go down. The notes that I need in F sharp major are F sharp, A sharp, and C sharp. As always, I'm just going to write the root of the chord in the bass. 
not because music is required to do that, but just because that's, a, that's an assumption that we're making to simplify things for the purposes of this lecture. All right, and so the goal is to do an upshift connection and then a downshift connection. To upshift from C major to F sharp major, C would go up to C sharp, E would go up to F sharp, and then G would go, that's a terrible A, G would go up to A sharp. Those are the closest paths between the notes and their nearest neighbors above. So C moved up one, E moved up two, and G moved up three, giving me a total motion of six between these two chords. Now let's do the same thing, but going down. So instead of moving C up to C sharp, what's the closest thing that it could go down to? Here, the closest thing we could descend towards is A sharp. E, that'll go all the way down to C sharp. And G, well, that doesn't have far to go because F sharp is the root of the second chord. So doing it this way, C to A sharp, that went down two. E to C sharp went down three. And G to F sharp, that went down one. And again, that adds up to six. But we moved in the opposite direction and each one of the notes moved a different amount. So if I want to play a tritone root motion, I have two very different possibilities for how to do that. One of them sounds like this, going up. And one of them sounds like this, going down. And actually, in principle, um, since a tritone away from F sharp would take me back to C sharp, I could just chain these together. For example, um, I could start from C and then just continually go up and up and up like this. You sort of get the picture at this point. I could also do the reverse, I could go down. So, and every one of those chord progressions sounds more or less like the same amount of effort because I'm always making six half steps of motion between the chords. So coming back to this picture over here, this is the basic idea. But this only tells us about major chords, and it's still relatively complicated. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to find a way to simplify this, and then a way to add in minor chords to this picture as well. The way we're going to do that is, first of all, let's uh, erase everything we have so far so that we're just back to an empty circle. And instead of imagining 12 different points around this circle, I want to simplify it just to four. What we're going to do here is at the top of the circle, I'm going to put all three of the chords that are neither up nor down from C major. So C to C would be, you know, just staying the same, C to A flat and C to E. Those are the two that involve contrary motion, like we talked about at the beginning. Now, over here, on the right, I have C to B, C to E flat, and C to G. All three of these involve motion in the same direction. 
Do you remember which direction this is? If I'm starting from C and going to any of these three, am I going to go up, am I going to go down, or is this the case where they're tied? Well, if you, if you don't remember, one way you could think about this is C major to B major. B is obviously a half step below C. So this is a case where to get from C major to B major, I would just be shifting everything down by a half step. C to B, E to D sharp, G to F sharp. And if that's down, and I'm saying that these three should be equivalent, then here I'm writing all of the chords that could go down from C major. Notice, by the way, that since back here, these equilateral triangles, they divide up the octave symmetrically into major thirds. My blue triangle spells out an augmented triad, C, E, and A flat. Well, A flat, C, and E, that's A flat augmented. My pink triangle, B flat, D, and F sharp, that's B flat augmented. So all of these equilateral triangles are spelling out augmented triads. So over here, C, A flat, E, B, E flat, G, these are going to be augmented triads also. I'm basically just condensing the information that we had before. Over on the left, I'm going to write the three triads, F, D flat, and A, that are all upshifts from C. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to write the three triads that could go either way, that could be up or down from C. All right, one thing, one thing that I want to point out about this is that there's actually nothing at all that's special about C major once I've drawn this picture. That it turns out that any motion where you're moving clockwise around the picture, clockwise motion is always going to be downshift motion. So C to B is downshift motion, but the same is true if I want to go from, let's say, G right here to D right here. That's clockwise motion. That should be a downshift. Or let's say D flat right here to C right here, or to A flat to E. All of those would be downshift motion. Whereas counterclockwise motion, stuff that moves this way, that'll be upshift motion. So for example, if I wanted to go from B to E or B to A flat, that motion would involve lifting the voices. And likewise, if I go all the way across the circle, like C to D, that could go either way. So B to A or B to D flat, that could go up or down if I go all the way across this four point circle. So I oriented this with the C major chord at the top, but actually if you have this picture in your head, it'll tell you where you can go from any of the major triads. Clockwise, one step clockwise is downshifting, one step counterclockwise is upshifting, and going all the way across the circle is tied. Now the next question that I think we're going to want to ask is what about minor triads? What if I wanted to go from C major to F minor or something like that? Where do those belong on a picture like this? And to answer that, I think it's, it's helpful, first of all, to think about doing something really simple, like going from C major to C minor. So C major is C, E, and G, and C minor is C, E flat, and G. So I think obviously the simplest way to connect those two chords is to do a downshift. I just lower E to E flat. But I'm only downshifting by one, whereas to get from C to B, I would be downshifting by 3, or C to G, I'm downshifting by 3. So from C major to C minor, I'm downshifting, but I'm not downshifting by a lot, which suggests that I might want to think about C minor as living somewhere like right here. 
a 45 degree rotation around the circle. Remember that clockwise is downshifting, so C minor should live clockwise from C major. So we're going to want to imagine putting minor triads on these diagonals of the circle. I guess the circle doesn't really have diagonals, but you know, 45 degrees and the 90, rotation, 90 degree rotations of that. C minor, which I'm going to represent with a lowercase c, is going to live right there. Likewise, let's think about an upshift from a major chord to a minor chord. For example, let's think about when I did before C, E, G to C sharp, E sharp, G sharp, C major to C sharp major. This was an upshift just by lifting everything one half step. That corresponds to this D flat right here, which I wrote unharmonically as D flat for no apparent reason. So this was a simple upshift. What if instead of going from C major to C sharp major, I went from C major to C sharp minor? Now C sharp minor has E natural, so I would just get rid of that sharp right there. That connection is still an upshift. C goes to C sharp and G goes to G sharp, but the E stays the same, so I upshift a little bit less. That suggests to me that C sharp minor as a triad belongs right there, halfway between C major and D flat major. So that's where we're going to put it. We'll put D flat minor right there. Now, for the upshifts, you might expect, I think reasonably, that there are going to be three chords that belong here, C to D flat minor, but then two other, two other minor triads. And because these positions for the major chords are all related by major third, you might expect that the same is going to be true here, D flat and then major thirds above and below D flat. That would be D flat, F, and A. And it turns out that it really is that simple, that these three minor chords are the ones that are a simple upshift from C major. And you could go through and you could work that out. Actually, C major to A minor was the very first thing I wrote in today's lecture. If I go all the way back to the beginning, right here, C major to A minor, we did see that that was an upshift. G went up to A and everything else stayed the same. So where are we? We are right here. And in fact, that's pretty much the way that all of this works. We can fill in the rest of the, of the minor triads like this. Now there are a few, a few complications here. First of all, notice that counterclockwise motion is an upshift, so I can go from these guys to these guys, and that'll be an upshift. We've already talked about how that's an upshift, but it turns out that all of this, moving all the way this way, counterclockwise along this circle, all of that is upshifting as well. So for example, C major to D minor, the best way to do that is just C, E, G to D, F, and A. This is a progression that exists within a major key, so we've actually talked about this before. But notice that what this means is when I'm mixing qualities, C major to D minor, it isn't tied like C major to D major was, because turning D major into D minor darkens that a little bit it breaks the tie and means that it's closer for me to go counterclockwise, that is an upshift, than it is to go clockwise, which would be a downshift. And this goes back to the idea of the smallest connection versus the second smallest connection that we talked about last time. C major to D minor, the smallest way is upshifting. There's another way that's not so bad, but it's a little bit farther, which would go clockwise around the circle. That would be a, a downshift. 
So when you're mixing qualities, there are no ties, like there are when you're, when you're staying within the same quality. Same sort of thing over here. Um, C major to C minor, we already talked about how that's a downshift. Basically, I have these three positions around the circle where the closest path is guaranteed to be some sort of downshift. Now, there is one really important exception right here. And that exception is the kind of spooky progression that we talked about before from C major to A flat minor. That's one of our three progressions that I started today with, where it moves neither up nor down. Those two chords have a kind of special relationship. It's the only kind of relationship where you mix the qualities of the triads and it doesn't go just upshift or downshift. Music theorists have a, have a name for this. They call this relationship the hexatonic pole for reasons that I don't want to get into. But C major to A flat minor is called a hexatonic pole relationship. And that's, I think, the one main thing that really complicates this picture, that there's always going to be this one exception when you go from major to minor, where it's not just a simple upshift or downshift. Every chord has one chord that counts as its hexatonic pole. So for instance, E flat major and B minor, two guys that are one step apart on the circle like this. Those are hexatonic poles with each other. And that connection is going to involve both motion up and down. Likewise, B major right here and G minor. These two are hexatonic poles. So if you think about chord progressions this way, that's the one thing that you have to watch out for. You sort of have to know that hexatonic poles have this special or interesting relationship. And it's a good relationship to be aware of because it sounds so cool. But if you think about it this way, I think this is a relatively efficient way to remember 24 different possible progressions between chords. We're, we're nearly to the end of what I want to talk about today, but I do want to give you at least one more musical analysis. And then there's just a little bit of more, a little bit one last piece of theory that we should talk about. So we've got maybe another 15 minutes or so to go through. But I want to take this idea thinking about chord progressions in this way, and use it to talk about the, the main theme from the film score by James Horner for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. And you'll hear that this involves a lot of these, these kinds of progressions that I think of as space chords, since they do interesting voice leadings that don't stay within the single key. Here's what this sounds like. And like, yeah, that sounds like science fiction music, right? But I think we can use the theory that we've been developing to understand what Horner is doing with the chord progression here. Now we could go through and we could, we could label what's going on with all of these chords, but you'll notice right away that one thing he's doing is he's basically just alternating back and forth between C major, and I'll highlight all of the C major chords in red, 
pretty much every other chord is a C major chord. And he's just bouncing back and forth between C major and various other sorts of contrasting chords. So for, for instance, he goes from C major to A minor, and then to A flat major, and then back to A minor, and then to F sharp major, A flat major, A major, F sharp major, and then finally E major. I know I'm breezing through that analysis a little bit quickly, but if you want to come back to this later and think through it for yourself a little bit more, hopefully you'll find that I haven't lied to you about what these chords are. So you might look at this, um, it almost seems like just a random assortment of chords. Can you use the perspective that we've been developing to describe how James Horner is, is picking the chords that he uses here. Is there some sort of underlying logic or pattern to these chords that alternate with C major? I'll give you a minute or two to think about this. Can you explain using voice leading, that is the smallest path between chords, to explain why he's picking these particular chords? While you think about it, I think I'll just play it for you again. without the melody. Well, one thing, one thing we might try to do is we might try to go back to the chart that we developed this guy right here. I'm going to erase the annotations that I have so far. I'll highlight in red, we're always coming back to C, but now I'll highlight in blue all the other chords that we go to. We go to A minor, we go to A flat major, we eventually go to A major, we go to F sharp major and we also eventually end up on E major. Do you notice anything about where the distribution of the chords that we use on this diagram? Exactly. Yeah, there's absolutely no downshifts. All of the chords that we use live on this side of the circle. They're all counterclockwise from C. They're definitely not clockwise from C. In other words, there are no downshifts. There are some things that maybe are neither up nor down, and there's one thing, F sharp, that we could use either way. But let's go back to the score and see how James Horner actually uses these chords. First of all, let's look at where he actually does use F sharp major. So for example, C to F sharp right here. The way that he uses it is voiced as an upshift. So this is a this is a progression that could go either way, but the way that he chooses to use is an upshift. So he's avoiding the downshift possibility there. And once you start to think about it like that, you start to pay attention, especially to what the melody is doing, I think you'll notice that there's a lot of motion in the melody from G up to a note. So G to A flat, G to A, G to A sharp, G to A, G to A sharp. 
and then down here sort of buried a little bit lower g to g sharp over here so actually there's a kind of logic to what horner is doing here he's kind of looking for all the chords that you could go to with some amount of upshift motion or some amount of ascending motion specifically always looking to bring g up to something so in the case of chord progressions where it should be tied, like C major to A flat major, or C major to E major, there is going to be some descending motion there. But not for G. Even in those cases, G goes up to A flat, or G goes up to G sharp. So there's this sort of like pushing upwards from our resting chord of C major, but then it keeps falling back to C major. I'm not sure what kind of meaning I want to ascribe to that, but it seems like a really consistent pattern here. That that's the that's the kind of motion that Horner is exploring with this title cue. Let me play it for you one more time and see if you can pay attention to that. See if you can sort of feel how there's always this upwards motion, especially from the note G. It's at, the, it's at the end of the melody that, that we finally break away from G as kind of the resting point for the melody. I think that's a technique that composers often do. They make an ending with some sort of change. And here we have that change by moving up to end away from G. But with a chord progression that fits the basic logic of, of what we've been doing so far. So I really like this. I think it's a, it's a pretty neat it's a pretty neat progression. At first, it feels kind of random and disorienting, but there is actually sort of a logic to it. All right, let's um, let's go back to this picture. This picture right here is the the main lesson for today. It really summarizes pretty much everything that you could want to know about progressions or at least small voice leadings of progressions between major and minor triads. And again, any motion clockwise, if the shortest path is clockwise, that'll be a downshift. If the shortest path is counterclockwise, that'll be an upshift. If you move directly across the circle, like for example, C major to any of these chords, that could be either an upshift or a downshift. Um, there isn't a name for this diagram, but I'll show you a diagram in a second that there is a name for. That's a good question. Um, and by the way, again, just like we said a couple pages ago, this is really true for any of the chords. So for example, if I start over here on, let's say, D minor, if I go directly across the circle, these are the chords that will be tied up or down from D minor. So D to C, you could go up or down. D minor to A flat minor, you could go up or down. Anything like that. And of course, if I stay within a single position, these are going to be the three chords that are neither up nor down from each other. So C minor to E minor, for example, is going to involve motion up and down. Or if I think about the Imperial March by John Williams, that used these two chords, E flat minor and G minor. And again, there was motion up and down between those two chords. And I'll remind you that you need to watch out for the so-called hexatonic pole because there's always that one anomalous relationship between, oh, I don't know, let's say F major and D flat minor. That seems, since it's clockwise motion, that seems like it should be a downshift, but it's actually going to be both down and up in different voices.
But there's one last kind of neat thing to pay attention to. Let's think about starting from C, as always. And if I go from C major to C minor, what's the total amount of motion I need to do to get there? Well, it's just one, right? I lower E to E flat, and that goes down by one. What about if I go from C major to E minor? How far do I have to move for that? I have C, E, G, and that's actually going to turn out to go to C, oops, sorry, that's going to go E, G, and B. Those are the notes I need for E minor. C to B is just one half step, so that's a motion of one altogether. I'm going to skip talking about A flat because that's the hexatonic pole. That's, as always, going to break our pattern. But otherwise, going one step clockwise seems to correlate to just having to move one half step down. Similarly, if I start from C and I go to, let's say, B major, how far down does that go? Well, I move everything down by three. If I go from C major to G major, if you did the homework or you remember from previous lectures, that ends up requiring three half steps of motion down also. As it turns out, does E flat, that's three half steps away from C. We've talked before about how these three chords, they're all kind of demonically six half steps away from C. And it turns out that all of these guys are five half steps away from C. So it almost seems like we can read from this diagram not only what direction I have to go, but also how far I have to go. But you might be wondering, well, what about two half steps? Or what about four half steps? It seems like I'm, there are some gaps in this picture. I've got one, three, five, and six, but what happened to two and four? In fact, we can extend the picture to make room for motions of two and four half steps also. So what we'll do is we'll sort of shift everything over. This was where one lived. This was where three lived. Six. Wait, now I'm confused. So I can revise this diagram by shifting the minor chords. They're actually a little bit closer to major in one direction than in the other direction. And it turns out that there are things that fill in the gap. There is actually something that belongs right here, and there is something that belongs right here. So there is something that's a two semitone downshift from C. There's also something that's just a one semitone upshift from C. Can you figure out what that ought to be? And actually, I think maybe it's easiest to imagine if you go this way. So if you imagine starting on C major, is there some reasonable sort of chord that I could get to by taking just one of these notes and raising it by a half step? And there are a couple of different possibilities that you could explore. But I think one natural one to think about is to say there's something kind of important about augmented triads. We saw that at each one of these positions, the roots of the chords spell out an augmented triad. If I take C, E, G, yeah, exactly, C augmented, and I, wrote, and I raise G to G sharp, that's a one semitone upshift, which suggests to me that C augmented, which I'll write as C plus, lives right here. And of course, C augmented is enharmonically equivalent to E augmented and A flat augmented. All three of those are, are kind of the same chord, up to enharmonic respellings. 
And in fact, it turns out that that really does complete this picture, that every one of these blank spots on the diagram, I can fill in with some sort of augmented chord. They follow a pattern like this. So C major to here, one semitone upshift takes me to C augmented. Over here, that's a motion of two along the circle. That tells me that I should be able to get from C major to B augmented with a two semitone downshift. Can I make that work? Yeah, I think I can. I take C down to B. I take E down to D sharp. And I leave G where it was. Or if that bothers you, I can say, well, OK, G is the same as F double sharp, but who likes that, right? And this guy right here, B D sharp G, is basically B augmented. Sorry, I meant two is the motion for this whole distance. I should really write two right there and one right here. And so in principle, this is three semitones away. This is four semitones away. I should be able to figure out that D augmented is a five semitone downshift from C major. And I'll leave that as an exercise for you to explore, but you should be able to make it work. And I think it's pretty gosh dang neat that this works out, that with the exception of the hexatonic pole, this basically lets you predict what the closest path between any major, minor, or augmented triad ought to be. That's fun. And you can do a lot of different things to sort of explore how this might work. You can, you can imagine using this almost as like a map that you could explore for chord progressions. And you asked, is there a name for this diagram? This is basically a simplified version of something that does have a name. Um, so let me show, let me show you the, the thing that's actually named. To, to go from this thing that we've built up together to the named diagram, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate everything clockwise by one click. So I'm going to rotate this, you know, this way so that at the top of the diagram right here, I'm going to put C augmented right there. So then C major is going to live over here at like one o'clock on the diagram. And music theorists do that because it's sort of nice for numerical reasons. So I'm just going to click everything over one hour on this clock face. As I promised, C augmented is right there. C major now lives here. And this diagram, if I change it just a, a little bit, gives you this thing right here. A flat augmented is the same thing as C augmented. And at one o'clock, we still have C major, A flat major, and E major. Now I've separated them out into three different points. You can see that this is basically the same diagram with extra lines, a little bit more structure than just the circle I had before. This diagram is called cube dance. And let me tell you a little bit about how to read this. Every time you've got a chord that's connected to another chord by a line, that line represents moving one semitone. So for instance, C major, to A flat augmented or C augmented, that involves one half step of motion, G moving up to G sharp. Likewise, C major moving to C minor, that's a motion from E to E flat. C major to E minor, that's moving C down to B. You can see C to A flat, there's no single semitone motion between those two guys. What I have to do, you sort of have to imagine starting from C, raising G to, to A flat, and then lowering E to A flat, and that gets you from C major to A flat major. You can also see why the so-called hexatonic pole relationship, that is, 
C major to A flat minor is sort of the odd thing out, the, the weird relationship, because there is no line connecting these two chords. To get from C major to A flat, I have to do something kind of excessive, like start from C, go to C minor, go to B augmented, and then go from B augmented backwards, backtracking to A flat minor. So there's three steps along the diagram, which corresponds to three different half-step motions between these two hexatonic pole-related chords. So again, this diagram, if you don't want this complicated sort of thing and you just want something simple to remember, that's what these circles do for you. But if you want something a little bit more informative, that you want a little bit more information, that's what, that's what cube dance is for. And there's a lot of fun that you can have exploring different ways of moving around the cube dance diagram. You can sort of imagine composing chord progressions as taking just different paths along the diagram. You could say, well, what would it sound like to do this sort of thing? What would a chord progression that goes all the way around sound like? And you can actually use this kind of to chart the motions around a piece of music like this. So you can use it as a composer, or you can use it as an analyst, and sometimes it shows you really neat stuff. If I find the time to type up another homework-like problem set, I'll, I'll try to come up with some exercises for you to do to explore this. I think this is just really cool. You can, you can waste hours exploring the possibilities here. So this is the image that I'd like to leave you with. This is sort of the end point for today's lecture. Yeah, I know, this is, this is just amazing. This, is, this encodes so much information. Um, and it's really cool, right? Because this, um, this encapsulates a lot of purely musical relationships as a kind of, as a kind of geometry. This, this is what's, this is, you can think of this as what mathematicians call a graph or a network. This is basically a, a kind of topological structure. So you can actually get into really cool, interesting mathematical questions about what's going on here, what's making this work musically. But that's, that's for a whole other time. Before I let you go, I do, I do want to share with you that I'm not, I'm not the person who invented all of this, that this is, I'm sharing with you the results of relatively recent research in music theory. So in particular, here, I mean, here's my bibliography for today. Here are my citations. Cube dance comes from this, this article by Jack Douthit and Peter Steinbach. Steinbach, I, I don't know if he says it with a, with a German CH or an American CH. But this, this is the article that invented cube dance. So if you want to go back to the original article where that diagram was invented, this would be the thing to go to. But I do want to mention a couple of other things. First of all, this book, Audacious Euphony by Richard Cohn, I think is just a tremendously appealing and accessible and really, really cool short, like I think it's a 250 page book it's not exactly a textbook, but I think it's also accessible to people who are at the level of understanding my lecture. If you want to learn more about this sort of thing, that this would be the book that I recommend to you, Audacious Euphony by Richard Cohn. It talks you through building up cube dance and all sorts of other cool chord progressions that are sort of like this. And then I wanted to mention to you work by another music theory researcher named Frank Lehman who has a great book called Hollywood Harmony, where he analyzes things like the music to Star Wars, Star Trek, A Beautiful Mind, um, Lord of the Rings, all sorts of really interesting analyses of Hollywood film scores along these lines, using these kinds of theoretical tools. It's another really great book. If you don't, if you don't want to shell out the money for a book and you can't find it in your library, there's also this article, whoa, called Hollywood Cadences, which I mentioned to you because this one's freely available online um, and even includes some, some, clicks from, some clips from like Jurassic Park and Revenge of the Sith. 
he goes through and analyzes the chord progressions in those film scores. It's in a journal called Music Theory Online. You can, you can see what the URL is. I'll post a link to this on Reddit also. This article is a little bit dense. It gets a little bit technical in terms of using music theory that uh, you might have to take a class to understand. But you might just look at his examples and, and appreciate the cool music that he talks about. So that's my bibliography for this lecture. So I've been talking for 90 minutes now. You can probably hear that my voice is getting a little sore. I think I'm basically talked out at this point, but I do have a little bit of time to answer any questions that you guys might have. So is there anything that you'd like to hear me talk more about right now before I go? Ah, what's up next time? Okay. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fair. Um, so next time, I think what I'm going to talk about is scales. So far, we've been talking about chords, major, minor, augmented chords. But it turns out that you can ask really similar sorts of questions about scales and changing from one key to another. Like what happens when I go from C major to F major or C major to E major as major scales rather than major and minor chords? There are really interesting connections with that sort of thing. And if you've ever heard of the idea, yeah, exactly. Modulation is the technical term that music theorists use to name that. And this way of looking at things actually tells you a lot about how modulations work. Also, if you've ever heard of the idea of modal brightness, the idea that Lydian is brighter than Ionian, which is brighter than Mixolydian, which is brighter than Dorian, those are modulations of another sort. And they're actually basically upshifts or downshifts between different modes. So we're going to talk about that sort of thing next week. And there are a couple of questions from, from the problem set that I posted last time where I asked you to think about a, a very general rule for this sort of thing. I know some of you worked on solving that. We didn't have a chance to talk about it today, so we'll talk about that next time in connection with modulations between different possible scales. So that's the, posi that's the plan for next week. And if... If there's still interest two weeks from today, I think we can also talk about similar sorts of questions with seventh chords. What happens if I try to play this sort of game with dominant seventh chords, minor seventh chords, or whatever else? So this idea has legs. We can apply it basically to talking about other sorts of connections between musical objects.